of all the figures associated with the quantum revolution, none are better known or more controversial than Werner Heisenberg. His brilliance, mathematical acumen, and ability to take intellectual risks allowed him to not only resolve the first quantum crisis arising from the failure of the old model, but to hold fast to his probabilistic approach to quantum transitions in the face of withering opposition. As a result of his fortitude, he was able to, along with Bohr and Pauli, create the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory. Heisenberg, however, has another, much darker legacy that must also be discussed. As the Nazi party came to power in 1932, Heisenberg, unlike so many others, chose to remain in Germany and work for the regime. As a result, there has been a prolonged historical debate as to his role in the project to develop first an atomic energy source and then an atomic weapon. There are serious questions as to whether he attempted to warn Bohr of Germany's progress and whether he might have attempted to sabotage the project or at least slow its progress. Some historians have claimed that Heisenberg should be considered a Nazi collaborator and, perhaps, should have been charged with war crimes. In the next several podcast episodes, we'll look at the life and work of this man and attempt to understand both his scientific contributions and his political choices in a country where he spent two world wars and helped create a revolution. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom, Episode 16.2, Supplemental, The Pathfinder. Before I begin the narrative, let me acknowledge my primary source of information for this episode. In addition to the other sources I have mentioned previously, I will be taking a great deal of information from David Cassidy's biography of Heisenberg titled, Beyond Uncertainty, Heisenberg, Quantum Physics, and the Bomb. For those of you who are both interested in the history of science and of 20th century Europe, specifically Germany, this is truly an exceptional work. It will help you understand not only the life of Heisenberg, but the social and cultural conditions of upper middle class Germany throughout the period and how that portion of German society interacted and influenced the political events of the time, especially in the period between the wars. I highly recommend it. Werner Heisenberg was born on December 5, 1901 in Würzburg, Germany. His family had transitioned from solid German craftsmen into the upper middle class of academia within the last generation, with his father, August, earning a PhD in classical studies in Greek and Latin, and his grandfather on his mother's side becoming the headmaster of one of Munich's most prestigious gymnasiums. As was common in academia in Germany during the period of the Wilhelmian Empire prior to the Great War, Heisenberg's father taught first as a gymnasium teacher prior to being selected as the only professor of medieval and modern Greek studies in Germany. As the chair of the professorship was at the University of Munich, the family moved there when Werner was about five years of age. The Heisenberg family lived what was a typical upper middle class life in Munich with a strong emphasis on social promotion and career success. The elder Heisenberg encouraged a sense of competition between Werner and his older brother Erwin something that would contribute to a deeply strained relationship between the two, but that also spurred Werner to strive to excel at those things where he felt he had an advantage, including mathematics and music. At age nine, he was enrolled in one of the two most prestigious gymnasia in Munich, the one that happened to be run by his maternal grandfather. A word here is probably in order regarding the gymnasium education system in Central Europe around this time. While there are strong parallels in the gymnasium system to the American K-12 education process, it should be noted that at this time there are also some really important differences. 
as Germany and Austria and much of Central Europe have long had a tiered public education system where students of different ability or interest will move through different public education curricula or systems. The gymnasium system was established for those students who showed the greatest potential for academic rather than professional or vocational work. As such, there is a specific intent to prepare students to enter university education with a somewhat accelerated and more rigorous curriculum than is found in most public schools in America. Think of it as a college prep curriculum on steroids. A student graduating from a gymnasium would be prepared at the level of the first two years of college for a student in a typical single-track public education system like the one found in the United States. In the early 20th century in Germany, the curriculum was strongly influenced by the classical liberal arts, with an emphasis on languages, music, literature, and mathematics. While sciences were included in the curriculum, they were somewhat less emphasized and broader in scope. While Heisenberg took about three years of physics at one level or another, he also studied astronomy, chemistry, geology, and even paleontology. What is remarkable is that the Great War disrupted Heisenberg's final four years of gymnasium education. During this time, he was organized into a paramilitary unit with his classmates to do a good bit of home front work, which included working on farms in the region as more and more military-aged men were called to fight in the increasingly bitter and deadly struggle. As Britain's blockade of German shipping slowly cut off the flow of food into Germany, Heisenberg faced the very real possibility of starvation during the particularly brutal winter of 1917-1918. Nevertheless, in spite of the disruptions and the fact that his courses only met irregularly, not only was Heisenberg able to complete the coursework, he used the extra free time to push further ahead in his studies than he might otherwise have been able to do if the structured curriculum of his school had been more rigorously enforced. The real test for Heisenberg came shortly after the war ended. While he had just avoided the military draft and the possibility of frontline action, post-war Germany was a really tumultuous place at a really tumultuous time. To understand this, it's useful to take just a moment to consider the bigger picture. When Germany lost the Great War, what we call World War I, it created a sense of deep bitterness within the country itself, something Hitler would seize upon later. On one hand, there were those who tended towards ultranationalism, who clung to the fiction that German forces hadn't actually been defeated. The bigger group, however, were those who felt that the war had been a colossal failure on nearly every level. They saw it as a product of an old monarchical imperial system that was outmoded and outdated. Those who accepted this picture felt that radical reform was necessary to the political structure of Germany and engaged in activities to see that reform take place. These people fell into two broad groups. I want to say here I am absolutely oversimplifying this. The two groups were social progressives and communists. Now in Munich, where the Heisenbergs lived, while the social progressives allied with the Weimar Republic tried to take the reins of government, they were soon forced out by communist elements. This quote-unquote red, to use the historical terminology, government, then went on something of a purge to root out what they saw as former monarchists. While there was sympathy for many of the citizens in Munich at the time for a more egalitarian system, the violence quickly turned all but the most radical against this new government. When more conservative paramilitary forces were sent from Berlin to protect the citizens to put a stop to this violence, many of the local group organized to support the incoming quote-unquote white forces. Heisenberg and his gymnasium's paramilitary boys troop was one of these units. While Heisenberg downplayed the serious nature of these activities and his role in them, in his memoirs, his wife recounted that while he was never involved in direct fighting during this battle for Munich, he was witness to both the violence of the clashes in the city and the life and death circumstances this aftermath involved. The white forces quickly defeated the red forces in Munich and brought a certain level of social order to the city. 
However, after the fighting ended, the whites instituted a period of terror of their own, eventually killing thousands of suspects who were thought to have collaborated with the Red government. Heisenberg's troop was often assigned to prisoner guard duty for men who were charged with treason. On one occasion, Werner had the duty of being the night watch for the prisoner sentenced to die the next day. To pass the time, he asked the man about his life, and over the course of those dark hours, he came to understand the polar soul's story. In the morning, he went to the appropriate authorities and explained that the man had been caught up in events, as he had been merely trying to make due for his family. Heisenberg argued that the man's life should be spared, and it was. Over the course of the next year, things would settle down in Munich, but it would be some time before everything got back to something resembling normalcy. During this period, Heisenberg became involved in what was likely the most socially formative activity of his entire life. As the war ended and the peacetime government came into being, there were thousands of young men and boys throughout Germany who had been training to fight and who now had little to do. Some of these youngsters gravitated towards the German equivalent of the Boy Scouts. While the movement had roots in the international scouting umbrella, it would soon reject two of scouting's fundamental characteristics, a focus on being an international organization and an emphasis on traditional Victorian moral virtues. Instead, the German incarnation, which would become known by the name the Pathfinders, found itself wrapped up in the sense of disillusionment many youth felt coming out of the war. There was this pervasive sense that they had been betrayed by the older generations and that they had to find a better way forward. Unfortunately, the larger movement had a difficult time agreeing on much more than this basic belief. Heisenberg himself soon became sort of a senior leader in the Munich group of this organization, these Pathfinders. He wasn't quite an adult figure at first, but he was old enough to lead the younger members. In 1919, a number of the groups from around Germany came together to discuss the future of the movement at an old castle with an ancient wood up the mountain behind it. The boys slept in the forest and held their meetings in the courtyard of the castle. Very quickly, there developed a split in the group with some of the leaders advocating a complete withdrawal of the movement from public and political life in order to pursue the goals of German Romanticism. Another group advocated for a strong identification with German nationalism and Teutonic ideals and virtues found in the German heritage. The differences threatened to drive a wedge between the two factions, and for the first time, but not the last, Heisenberg found himself in a space in the middle. He found value in both arguments as well as ideas to criticize. More than anything, he felt like there had to be a center in which both drives could be accommodated. During the meeting, the two groups quarreled, and at one point, the Romantic faction withdrew from the discussions, leaving the Nationalists to fashion the direction of the movement. However, cooler heads prevailed, and the more reactionary ideas of the Nationalists were tempered to the point that the Romantics were persuaded to rejoin the discussions. While Heisenberg's center remained elusive, the group finally came to a sort of live-and-let-live live agreement where individual groups and leaders could pursue independent paths as long as the larger movement wasn't pulled into political debates. On the last evening of the meeting, the various troops were gathered in the courtyard of the castle to tell stories, play music, and share food. As the night went on, Heisenberg tells of a moment that seems to have crystallized his vision of a center. During a lull in the activity, a sound came from the forest above the castle. It was someone playing a violin piece by Bach that was so beautiful and so piercing that it brought most if not all activity in the courtyard below to a stop. As this perfect melody floated down, Heisenberg says that he realized that his center would not be found in the everyday messy things of the world, but in the abstract beauty of math and music. It was there, in these things he felt, that he and others would be able to find a new path 
out of the wreckage and ruin that the old politics had led Germany into. From this point, there were two very important outcomes for Heisenberg and his involvement over the next few years with the Munich Pathfinders. First, he kept the group independent from the other, more nationalistic factions of the movement. While a number of the leaders in this broader movement would go on to become high-ranking Nazi officials when Hitler brought these Pathfinder groups into the Hitler Youth, Heisenberg did not follow the path they advocated. Second, Heisenberg came to understand leadership in a way that would profoundly influence his decisions once the Nazis did come into power. In the movement, there was seen to be two types of leaders. The first was the schoolmaster of the headmaster. This type of leader led from a position of authority based on their superior knowledge, social standing, or position. They directed others not because they had earned the respect or trust of the individuals, but because they had acquired either the knowledge, wealth, or rank to impose their wills on the lesser people in the structure. As you might imagine, this type of leadership was not well regarded in a group of free-spirited young men. The second type of leader was called in German a Führer. It is difficult now to approach this word with any type of neutrality because of its association with Hitler, but try to set aside just for a moment all of the negative associations the history justifiably brings. In the Pathfinder movement, the Führer was the type of leader who did not command his charges, but rather inspired them through example and charisma. The boys didn't follow this kind of leader because they had to, but because he acted in such a way that they wanted to. As a side note, you can see why Hitler would want to co-opt this view of leadership, regardless of whether he actually followed it or not. There's a story from Heisenberg's time as his troop leader, which, for those who may have been Boy Scouts in America or England, was something like a hybrid between a senior patrol leader and a scoutmaster. The group had gone on a multi-day hike something Heisenberg led them on a couple of times a year. Some of the young men had gone through their food too quickly, not rationing it properly, and thus were required to eat something they called cement, which was really a mixture of water, flour, and blueberries they had gathered along their hike. One of the young men became frustrated that some of the other boys wouldn't share what they had rationed and decided to stop hiking. After a good bit of cajoling from the other boys, had not convinced this younger lad to resume the hike. Heisenberg sent the rest of the troop along its way under the leadership of an assistant. He then sat down next to the young man for a time. At some point he pulled out a letter and he read it. At the end of the letter, Heisenberg stood up, put on his backpack, and prepared to head down the trail. And the young man did exactly the same. The sources I found don't say what the letter was, or even if Heisenberg read it aloud. But the fact that he was willing to sit and wait until the young man was ready was enough to inspire the boy to rejoin the group. This was the type of leadership that was deeply valued in the Pathfinder movement. Now on a personal note, I was a Boy Scout from age 11 to age 20. Setting aside some of the political and social debates around the movement in the United States today, I can honestly say that it was the most formative experience of my life. And the things I learned while a scout, I still use on a daily basis now some 30 years later. I had many opportunities to witness and practice this type of leadership, the kind that is found in this story about Heisenberg. And I can tell you it's a really powerful thing. These sorts of experiences embed themselves into a person and become a part of the very fabric and value structure and code of ethics of that individual. And I have little doubt that the same is true for Heisenberg. For me, this offers what may be the most cogent explanation why he didn't take the path followed by so many of his German science colleagues when Hitler came to power. His retreat into the ideals of nature, mathematics, and music from the politics and social changes of his time blinded him, I think, to the real nature of what was going on in Germany after 1932. More than this, however, is that once he recognized the issues, he had young men who had left hearth and home to work for him once he became a full professor in Leipzig. For him, to take one of the offers to immigrate to England or the United States would have meant abandoning those individuals. 
more than anything, I think that this was just something that he couldn't do. In saying this, I'm not trying to argue that his work, perhaps even collaboration, with the Nazi government was correct, but rather, given his values, understandable. I think his actions also warn those of us who would step into a world divorced from the nitty-gritty of human interactions at the public square. While Heisenberg was hardly alone in this in the academic community in Germany, his withdrawal from the conversations in politics in the 1920s allowed those groups most associated with the ultra-national and often anti-Semitic to dominate the discourse and make Hitler's rise to power that much more possible. Before I move on to some of Heisenberg's scientific work, I hope you'll forgive me this digression into something a bit different. Heisenberg is a complicated man, and he lived at a really complicated time. In the interest of brevity, I've had to leave out a number of details, especially about the interaction of social classes in Germany at this time, something that certainly influenced Heisenberg, who was raised in an upper middle class, intent on preserving its standing and privileges before, during, and after the Great War. Again, for those interested in a more complete accounting of these issues, I refer you to Beyond Uncertainty. Okay, so back to the scientific side of the biography. As things settled down in Munich, Heisenberg stood for his gymnasium exams and passed them with strong marks, especially in math and science, where, exam where his examiner wrote they had never seen a student as advanced. With this credential, Heisenberg was entitled to attend any university in Germany. With inflation being something of issue, though Due to his father's public service position as a professor, it was not nearly as big an issue as it was for many Germans at this point. Heisenberg chose to stay in Munich and attend the university there in 1920. German higher education was different for those who had passed their gymnasium exams. Rather than attending a course of study as a student does in the United States, with a strong early emphasis in the liberal arts before moving into coursework focused on a major subject, German students could identify a professor he or she wished to work with and become a part of that professor's institute. This was accomplished after the student was examined by the professor for suitability with the professor's research program. Now in German physics, this was complicated by the relative prestige held by theoretical and experimental physics. German physics had established itself during the 19th century through success of its experimental physics program. Centered around the work of Hermann von Helmholtz, the institutes in Germany's universities had done an exceptional job and done exceptional work in many areas of physics. However, as the 20th century dawned, there was a shift in how physics was being done. More and more often, work was being done that was following a somewhat different method with hypothesis formation following from mathematical analysis based on empirical observations. This new theoretical physics was first introduced by Maxwell in England, but was soon picked up in Germany and Austria by Boltzmann. Shortly thereafter, there were physics institutes devoted completely to this method of investigation being overseen by physicists such as Planck. This approach received an enormous shot in the arm when Einstein published his papers in 1905 and was further boosted by Bohr's quantum description of electrons' behavior in the atom. However, as successful as these approaches were turning out to be, theoretical physics in 1920 still held a secondary status behind the work of experimentalists. It was felt that empirically grounded data was just more fundamental than descriptions based on a mathematical derivation and as such, the most prestigious positions in the German system still went to the experimentalists. As a result of this, those individuals with talent who lacked social standing often found an easier path into theoretical physics at this time, including those of Jewish heritage. This would become an issue during Heisenberg's second year of graduate study. 
Upon Heisenberg's arrival at the university, his plan was actually to study mathematics with the Munich mathematics professor Ferdinand von Lindemann, a colleague of Heisenberg's father. Lindemann was something of an applied mathematician with a background in number theory who was co-director of Munich's mathematical physical seminar along with Wilhelm Wien, an experimentalist. The other two professors in the seminar were the mathematician Ariel Voss and the low man on the totem pole, Arnold Sommerfeld, who was, of course, a theoretical physicist. Heisenberg's interview with Lindemann, however, was a disaster due to the older professor's impending retirement and lack of interest in taking on new students. After some consideration, Heisenberg decided to approach Sommerfeld. Sommerfeld was a researcher who was always on the lookout for talented young students, having taken in Wolfgang Pauli just two years earlier. In interviewing Heisenberg, he found an agile young mind willing to work hard to achieve more than what was merely required, and so he admitted the young man even before Heisenberg had had a chance to take any of the more advanced courses in the Institute. So let's take just a couple of minutes to talk about Sommerfeld to sort of set the stage here. Sommerfeld had made his name working on a number of problems related to Bohr's model of the atom. He had started as a mathematician, but had migrated over to physics through work as a student at an institute much like he was a part of at Munich. The source of his interest was the work of William Thomson, who had tried to envision a mathematical model that would explain Maxwell's electromagnetic fields. After doing his dissertation work on the topic, Sommerfeld moved to Göttingen, where he worked with a brilliant mathematician by the name of Felix Klein. Klein's program focused not just on developing mathematical theory, but also on bringing those mathematical tools into the sciences. Sommerfeld worked with Klein for 13 years before moving to Munich to teach theoretical physics in 1906. Almost immediately, Sommerfeld worked to establish an institute for theoretical physics and to make it a center for investigations into relativity theory and quantum theories. In this task, Sommerfeld was eminently successful, soon producing a steady stream of excellent theorists. Initially, Sommerfeld had the distinction of being the only person in Europe who could lecture on both relativity and quantum physics simultaneously. Moreover, he was an exceptional teacher who possessed a, quote, logical and mathematical penetration of established and problematic theories and the derivation of consequences that might lead to their confirmation or rejection. This was said by his colleague Max Born, who we'll talk about later. His ability to both inspire and gradually cull the weaker students from the program helped ensure the reputation of the Institute and thus guarantee a steady supply of talented students. As I've discussed in a previous podcast, Sommerfeld was a collaborator of Bohr's in developing the old quantum mechanical of the atom. This work was based on spectroscopy, both experimental and theoretical. Heisenberg's entry into Sommerfeld's institute was fortuitous as it coincided with the beginning of a six-semester teaching cycle designed to introduce a student into each of the major subjects in physics. He also participated in seminars on contemporary physics, which meant, of course, relativity and quantum theory, as well as sessions focused on research methods and work. Like Rutherford and Bohr, Sommerfeld was also involved personally with his students, often inviting his charges to join him on Sunday outings and, when things got bad with the German economy, helping students who were struggling financially. Most important, Sommerfeld set a sterling example of an active and incisive researcher who collaborated with the best minds of his field and expected the most of his work. In this, one must think that in Sommerfeld, Heisenberg found a scientific Führer worth emulating. At the heart of the Institute was Sommerfeld's research seminar. Here, students would work with Sommerfeld to derive solutions to difficult problems and then be handed small research problems of their own. These would be worked up and then presented to the group for critical review. If the work was well done, it might stand as the student's dissertation topic or even be published. Heisenberg joined this group as a beginner in the program, much as Pauli had before him. He managed to survive the weeding out process that occurred, and he did well. 
It was from the work done in the seminar that Heisenberg would develop his dissertation as well as a number of his first papers. It was also as part of this group that Heisenberg first met Wolfgang Pauli. Pauli was sort of an unofficial deputy assistant assigned to oversee the work of the advanced students. He and Heisenberg formed very close professional friendship during the two semesters when they were both part of Sommerfeld's research group. While the two men were of very different personalities, they shared an intellectual curiosity and interest that was built on their mutual admiration for each other's abilities. It has been noted that while the relationship between Heisenberg and his older brother Erwin has very often tremendously strained, Pauli became the surrogate older brother Werner never really had. Pauli offered advice on research while still being strongly critical of the younger man's work when necessary and thus pushing him to try harder. With Summerfield acting as a surrogate father, Heisenberg had found a new family at the university whom he felt did not represent the old failed policies and politics of pre-war Germany and its imperial structure. This was a family he could trust with his training and his future, and accordingly he placed his education completely in Sommerfeld's hands. In a remarkably short time, merely three years, Heisenberg earned his doctorate and was able to progress to his habilitation. This step is an important part of the process not formally found in other educational systems. Earning a doctorate allowed one to teach in the gymnasium system in Germany, but to hold a professorial post, a student had to spend at least one additional year studying with another researcher and pass an additional set of oral examinations. When Sommerfeld left to le lecture in the United States for the 1922-23 academic year, he recommended that Heisenberg join the research group of Max Born and Gottingen. Due to his excellent work, Heisenberg was now a sought-after commodity in the world of German physics, and it was Born, who shared Sommerfeld's focus on atomic physics, who managed to snare the young talent. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave the story here for this week. As the length of the episode has reached its maximum sustainable length, we'll return next week to consider Heisenberg's work after Munich. I hope that you find our foray outside the strict physical work of Heisenberg interesting. While I debated on whether to restrict the podcast to just discussing his scientific contributions, I've decided that his life offers a really unique window into the broader historical developments in Europe during the 20th century. I'd like to hear from you to know if you share my sentiments on this matter. If you're enjoying the interplay between Heisenberg's more personal biography and the political developments in Germany, I'll be sure to continue along those lines. If not, let me know that too, and I'll make sure to include an appropriate adjustment in the material. In the next episode, I hope to, along with bringing you Heisenberg's work, discuss the post-war rise in anti-Semitism and how it affected Heisenberg both at Munich and in Göttingen. And I'd like to talk about that in terms of the broader development of those things in German academia throughout the country. So I hope you'll join me for that, and thanks again for taking the time to listen. So until next time, full sails on your journey.